I've become convinced recently that new forms of media and the internet are important for scientific communication and in the future will become more important. Traditionally we've been a scientist communicating our work by writing papers and spending a long time writing papers, putting those papers on the internet, submitting it to journals, and then more or less leaving it at that. Of course, we get invited to conferences, we get to travel over the world to communicate our work, but basically most scientists would spend a lot of their energy writing papers. But these days, the internet has democratized so many other forms of communication that were simply unavailable to us like 20 and 30 years ago. For example, we can now very easily typeset our own documents. It used to be in older times that we needed to ask a secretary to type any scientific paper that we wanted to publish. Music, sound, it gets easier and easier to, to share and communicate on the web. And in particular, one medium which seems to combine a lot of these advantages is that of video. I've become convinced that videos are a viable method of communicating scientific results. And I want to, in the coming weeks, experiment a little with this idea that we can use video as a viable means to communicate scientific information. Today I'd like to try out one particular idea I've been toying with, and that is to, well, put to rest some old papers that never really got round to publishing. I have, unfortunately, on the archive and also on my computer, a bunch of results which I never really took the energy to push through the refereeing process. For various reasons I gave up at various stages in the process. And today I'd like to, well, put these papers, one of these papers to rest by explaining the core ideas behind the paper and the main result, and then submitting this work as a video on YouTube so that you can at least get a flavor of what the paper is about. The paper in question is one that I wrote in 2008. It's a short three-page paper, and the objective of the paper was to derive some bounds on a problem of central importance in quantum information theory called the quantum marginal problem. The quantum marginal problem has its origins in the marginal problem of classical probability theory, which is concerned with the existence of a probability density function with given projections onto a set of coordinate subspaces. The setup for the quantum marginal problem is as follows. We suppose we have a tripartite quantum system comprised of three subsystems, A, B, and C. These are all finite dimensional systems, and that means that their Hilbert space is variously dA, dB, and dC dimensional, so that the total Hilbert space is C, dA, tensor C, dB, tensor C, dC. We're given, in the quantum marginal problem, the reduced states on two bipartite subsystems, AB and BC. And the task in the quantum marginal problem is then to find a state, a global state of the full system, the full tripartite system A, B and C, a global state rho ABC which is consistent with these two reduced states, rho AB and rho BC. And what does consistent mean? Well, consistent means that you, rho AB is found by tracing out subsystem C from rho ABC, and rho BC is found by tracing out subsystem A from rho ABC. To see that this problem is not completely trivial, let's consider an example. In this example, we suppose that AB and rho BC are both in pure maximally entangled states. In fact, let's just choose the singlet state for rho AB. State is maximally entangled. Similarly, for rho BC, we also choose the singlet state. In this particular situation, it turns out there is no global state of the tripartite system which is consistent with rho AB and rho BC. 
And this is a consequence of, a f of the fact that row AB is maximally entangled. If row AB is maximally entangled, then it's in a pure state. The, the bipartite subsystem is in a pure state. However, C is also entangled with B. But that's impossible if row AB is in a pure state and C is entangled with AB then C would have to also row AB would have to also be mixed and therefore th there is no tripartite state consistent with both single states we come now to the idea behind the contribution of this paper so given row AB and row BC we're going to look for bounds on the total number of solutions of the quantum marginal problem in terms of just information we can get easily from row AB and row BC. But there's a problem. How do we count the solutions? Well, because there could be more than one solution to the quantum marginal problem and we want to choose somehow independent solutions rather than solutions which are just slightly different from each other we come up with a notion of an, what an independent solution is to the quantum marginal problem. This is just a pure global pure state phi ABC consistent with row AB and row, C, row BC that has the property that it's orthogonal to all the other solutions that we find to the quantum marginal problem. This is at least one way to keep track of the number of truly independent solutions to the quantum marginal problem. We come now to the final argument behind the bound that I present in this paper. We're going to start by supposing that we have m orthonormal solutions and m independent solutions to the quantum marginal problem. Let's call them phi, a, b, c, j. And we're going to use these m orthonormal solutions to build another solution to the quantum marginal problem. However, this solution is no longer a pure state. This is a mixed state. And the state is very simple. We just take the equal mixture of all the solutions we've found, phi, a, j, a, b, c. This state is, by construction, also a solution to the quantum marginal problem. The trick now is to use the state rho a, b in com combination with an entropic bound to derive, finally, a bound on the largeness of m, the number of solutions, the number of independent solutions to the quantum marginal problem. And the inequality we're going to use is the strong subadditivity inequality. This is a powerful entropic inequality which relates the entropy of a tripartite system to its reductions on A, B, B, C, and just B. If we apply strong subadditivity inequality to our state rho A, B, C, it turns out, well, the left-hand side, we can calculate that. That's by construction, simply log to, log to base 2 of M. However, we have more information that we can easily deduce from the input to our problem, we can easily work out SAB and SBC. And if we apply the strong subadditivity inequality to log to base 2 of M, then we derive an upper bound in terms of these three entropic quantities. And simply taking both left-hand side and the right-hand side to the power 2, we obtain the final bound. One of the consequences of this inequality is that if the right-hand side is strictly less than 1, then there are simply no solutions to the quantum marginal problem. Let's see this inequality in action by applying it to the example that we covered at the beginning. In the example we covered earlier, rho b was a pure singlet state, as was rho b c. It's easy to compute the entropy of the pure singlet state, it's just zero and the von Neumann entropy of the reduced state on subsystem B is completely mixed and that's equal to 1. If we substitute these numbers into our inequality then we get on the right hand side the number of half which is strictly less than 1 and we confirm that there is indeed no solution. The moral of the story is that entropy inequalities give simple bounds on the quantum marginal problem. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. If you like the video, please like it. If you dislike it, of course, please dislike the video. And I look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you very much.